Crescent Crescent, home to York City Football Club, in case you were wondering. Um, but we start with a quote from Simon Inglis, uh, Football Grounds of Britain. Simon Inglis is a well-known journalist for The Guardian and sports writer. Always useful to quote on these occasions, particularly person here because he's referring to York and likening the medieval street pattern of York and its uh, shambolic development to the um, delightfully shambolic nature of the development of English football grounds. And that sort of um, writing um, uh, neatly fits in with the current discourse and research which shows that football grounds are keenly valued as cherished places and repositories of memory, conveying its intense senses of identity and belonging with the power to stir hearts and minds and evoke strong and enduring social responses. And this is especially true when grounds are relocated and the fan base is dislocated. Just some background, um, the project is funded by Historic England um, and uh, speaks to their current uh, strategy of place shaping and the enhancement of public benefit. Um, and it was felt that examples were needed to show how these aims can be addressed by the heritage sector and how we might then feed into ways in which we can shape the environment to give it greater meaning and resilience. And the question we were posed in this session, uh, should archaeology have an active role in place shaping the process and in order to create a living legacy? So this inter interrogation of the relationship between place and memory, very familiar discourse among cultural geographers and social geographers, um, it's that relationship between the tangible, the intangible heritage, always difficult particularly for football, um, and an important challenge which remains under-researched. So the development of, or redevelopment of Boot and Crescent for housing offers, we believe, an opportunity to meet this challenge, and to test imaginative ways of involving people for whom the ground holds great meaning, and to explore why they value the site and how it should be memorialised. I thought we'd just have a quick tour of redeveloped sites of former football grounds. Um, because many have now disappeared below housing estates, like Hooven will do, supermarkets, retail parks, often without a trace or a nod of recognition to their history and heritage. So what can we learn from these previous redevelopments? And what inspiration might we draw on to help shape the redevelopment of Hooven Crescent? So we start our tour in Morecambe. This plaque is laid in uh, uh, to mark marks the centre spot of Christie Park and commemorates uh, Christie himself, the club's benefactor, the thousands of fans, and those those people whose ashes forever remain here under a Sainsbury's car park. Or you can have your ashes remain under a BQ car park here in Huddersfield, site of Leeds Road, Road Stadium. Or under a Burger King in Bradford, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Brighton. Or in Leicester, under student flats. Anyone guess where this might be? Sunderland, Sunderland thank you. Notice no relegation place. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, a, a good point here is that the club, when they moved to the Stadium of Light, did take part of their old stadium with them. A, an appropriation of part of the Archibald Leach stand, which stood at Rosa Park, is now in the car park of the Stadium of Light. However, a bad mark against Sunderland is that if you go to the centre of Rosa Park now, there is a children's playground where no ball games are allowed. <laughs> Newcastle fans would tell you no football ever was played for Rogue Park. Anyway, uh, staying in the northeast, Ayrson Park, Middlesbrough. This we're getting a bit more imaginative now. Um, a housing development was proposed. This is going back to the mid eighties now. Um, uh, over uh, and and what an artist did, who was funded through a percent per art project, which was attached to a condition of the housing development scheme. He was simply doing what we would do, a map regression exercise, by placing the, the, the proposed uh, housing development 
over the site of the uh, original ground, and then chose to mark significant places associated with the ground, such as the centre spot or a penalty spot, with bronze sculptures, which still remain 20 years old today. I don't recommend you try and kick that football, by the way. <laughs> so. um, another uh, recent development where I think the imagination of the developer is starting to sort of move in our direction. You won't recognise this. This is the Victoria Ground in Stoke, or, or what remained of it until about four years ago. One of my favourite bits of graffiti on the surviving wall at the, at the back of the, at the main stand, give us a public. That's what the local community wanted. This site's been vacant for nearly 20 years. Well, he, he got his park, it's called Victoria Park, a uh, development of over 200 houses, which are currently being built. However, interestingly, a year ago, I went to the show house, pretending to be interested in buying a house, I was handed this development layout. No reference at all to the football ground. A month ago, I went back to the same show house and they gave me this. So the whole thing is now laid out with the superimposed with the, just like with in Middlesbrough, the, the former ground, the plan, showing even the point from which the Stanley Matthews scored a famous goal. <laughs> so if you're lucky to live in this house and boast that. And that's important because they've come up with some homespun blue plaques to mark houses which are laid out over particular parts of the ground. And actually this means these houses in the centre circle attract a higher price. Because most likely these houses are going to be bought by fans of Stoke City who want a piece of that, their history, their club. Now, uh, time doesn't permit me to talk about Highbury and its redevelopment. Um, that's a whole lecture in itself. Uh, but there are, it, and this is probably the best example in the world, of the reuse of a former football ground. Um, and simply, uh, the pitch was retained as a communal garden. The two main uh, Art Deco stands were listed. That bought us time to, to make Arsenal rethink the original scheme. And, uh, Basically, uh, you can get seven stories of units in a, an existing grandstand, which means you can go to seven stories in the adjacent new build, which meant you could get more units on the site and make a killing. Okay, I thought I'd better talk about some archaeology. Um, and the site in Bradford, this is the site of Bradford Park Avenue, it's ground, Park Avenue here, um, and the adjacent cricket ground. And this is a project from a few years ago, but just to give you some idea of why I say it's an archaeological site, this site, unlike the ones we've been, just been reviewing, uh, and unlike Boven Crescent, has never been redeveloped. Bradford Park Avenue went out of the league in 1970. It disbanded in 73. Its ground, dating from 1907, was just left to ruin. And it's still a ruin today. And it's the most extraordinary site you'll ever see if you're interested in football. This was taken about the late 70s. Instead of trees, instead of, instead of fans, trees now stand on these terraces. 15,000 people used to stand at the top end. But in that 40 odd year period, self seeded trees from the park across the road have grown through the concrete. Even in fossilised in the perimeter wall, you still have the original turnstiles and the original price in shillings and pence on the wall outside. Remarkable survival. So it's, to all intents and purposes, an archaeological ruin. So it, I approached it in the same way as you approach any archaeological site. We did a geophysical survey. <coughs> Here it is. Remarkable results. Chris Gaffney from the University of Bradford. Um, these white lines aren't actually there. What this resistivity survey is showing is, the, is the, risk, the anomaly created by constant liming of the soil over and over again. So you still have this trait of the original pitch markings, including also drains. And you could even argue you could, you could work out the tactics of the team 
because of the way the wear patterns on the wings or whether they were a long ball team just kicking it up the middle. We engaged with the local community, in this case, the fans. The club reformed in the 1990s. And so people old enough to remember the old stadium came back and helped us sweep, sweep the terraces and helped us with the excavation. You all heard of goal line technology. This is goal line archeology. span And this is me excavating, I think the world first, uh, one of the goalpost holes at the Horton Harch end of the ground, just in front of that terrace. Uh, in which someone had placed 14 plastic tinker. <laughs> Place deposit of 1970. Interesting. Also, on the, during the dig, it's not very common when, when you're excavating a feature for someone to produce a photograph of the thing you've just excavated with them standing next to it. Here's the goalpost in question. And then we found several objects like coins, we found a nappy pin, I won't go into the details of why, uh, but 55 coins all dotted around the goal area but actually marking where the net might have been. And you would think as an archaeologist, ritual deposits, um, what did we do? What are we talking about here? Why are these coins here and these lines? And of course it only took one of the volunteers who remembered the ground from the old days to just say, well that would have been a half-time collection. Kid, as kids, we used to walk around with a big sheet and people would throw coins from the terraces. And obviously, over 70 odd years of doing that, some coins missed the sheet, hit the, hit the net, dropped down. Hit the net, dropped down. Or we found those coins that were not retrieved. And it's stories like that which you know, reinforce this, this um, need for archaeology to engage with social history, obviously, and oral history, particularly. Um, because we only tell half the story, or not even half the story. <laughs> you know, we found some marbles. Sure, we probably thought that quite rightly they were thrown at the goalkeeper. We even interviewed the man who threw them, 50 years on. So you need both sides of the, of the evidence. You need the archaeology and you need the oral history. And, you, and without the archaeology, however, you won't get that oral history to come forward. That's what we discovered here. If you get the right number of people coming to help with the dig and the right age group, then you will get that response. And uh, we, this project achieved some national success in as much as we have an exhibition at the National Football Museum where my trowel currently is still an exhibit. <laughs> and uh, we also produced a book which again was a community uh, funded, in fact crowd funded project um, and uh, we got shortlisted for the Sports Book of the Year, Women in the Sports Book of the Year a couple of years ago. Uh, just to close then um, on what we're doing at Boolean Present. This is an ongoing project so I can't actually sort of neatly sort of com complete the story yet so watch this space. Um, and in this instance we are hoping to create a living legacy, create uh, a lasting legacy. And we are obviously having to deal with persimmon slide there to remind me to talk about persimmon homes and the difficulties we are going to have both as the local authority and historic England in negotiating the best way to memorialize this site based on the ideas and feedback which is coming through me from the fan base. And those emerging ideas center around what I'll say next. First of all, what is important here is the sense of place. There's no historic buildings of any interest, even though it's York. This is not a, an area which has any protective status other than it being on the edge of a conservation. Um, however, before the football ground was built in 1932, the site was the cricket ground bounded by this brick wall. So the brick wall boundary is still there from not just in the legacy of the football era, but from earlier times as well. And before it was a cricket ground, it was also an athletics ground. So retaining the boundary wall, which anyway is the boundary of the site for redevelopment, should should pose you would have thought much of a problem. One thing that comes through very strongly in the responses we're talking to businesses, local residents, fans, and the club is the need to have a focal point 
for memory and a focal point for orientation. This is so important, it seems, to these, these fans. They want to be able to pay their respects to this grand box, it's gone. They want to be able to position themselves in a, position, in a place where they can then imagine the grand or explain it to their family or whoever they're with. And they want somewhere to pay respects. Coming back to the ashes business, the 200 people's ashes are buried somewhere on this ground. The ashes, of course, won't be there. The, the ground's been turfed, the ashes will washed down. So how do we actually capture that significance, um, given that we don't even have the names of the individuals? Um, one idea is to create a memorial garden and to site the memorial garden around the section through this, this structure here, which is a unique survival of an English football ground. It's a tunnel, not the tunnel the players could emerge from, a tunnel which allowed rival fans to change ends at half time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you've anticipated my point. But yeah, it's unknown, it seems to be unknown to this generation and the previous generations that that traditionally was what you did. You followed your club by standing behind the goal they were kicking towards. So at half time, or indeed if they changed ends at the top, everybody shifted ends. There was only one way of doing that, it was through this very narrow tunnel. So you can imagine what sort of argy bargy went on in here. So that, and the fact that the tunnel was used as an air raid shelter in the Second World War, I think lends it this in, in extra significance, and it's worth preserving a section of it with a section of the terracing above it, and around which we place our memorial garden with this picket fence as a boundary to the hole, which is fronting the stand. And there are lots of stories about the picket fence as well. Just finally then, um, another feature of the ground, which seems to be quite unique to York, was the, the five-minute flag, a bit like uh, Mike's five-minute uh, <laughs> sticker. Five minutes before the end of the game, the flag was lowered. This was in an era when most people didn't have wristwatches, and there was no clock. So the only way to tell the time, to know how much time there was to your team to score the, the winning goal, or for you to leave in order to get your train, was when this flag came down. Wouldn't it be nice to have that flag back on the site? And what the most housing developers used next to their show houses? A flag on a flagpole. Let's just reuse it and keep it there permanently with a replica of this flag. And there are additional projects which could flow from these initial ideas, which the housing developer needn't be involved with, but which perhaps, you know, through the creation of a Friends of Booth and Crescent group, which could be the Supporters Trust or the club or both, um, you know, it, let's, let's have a mural on the site of, the, of that boundary wall. Let's uh, do more work on archives and local history and oral history, which is, needs to be captured. Um, perhaps a community excavation. Maybe the old cricket pavilion might survive lower, below the stand. Who knows? Um, various other ideas for keeping memories alive, including performance. Because if you've got a bit of terrace left in front of the public open space as planned, you've got a ready-made stage for perhaps an annual performance. Or just to kick a ball around, which you could play for. I'll finish there, just a couple of things. There's some videos we're making, we're documenting the project as we go on. There are four, uh, seven videos planned. Two of them are online on the Historic England YouTube. Channel. The third one, along with the first two, are being shown on a loop in the main hall at the Historic England uh, stand. And thanks very much for your support.